of you will remember um, in 2005 there was a conference that turned into a publication called Public Value and Heritage. Tessa Jowell made lots of comments, which if you read them today you wonder why it's taken us 14 years to go, yep, that was probably quite a good idea. But in, the, in talking about the public value of heritage at this time, the question was asked, what is our primary goal in this area? Is it to prove the intrinsic qualities of the historic environment? Is it to showcase the instrumental benefits of the historic environment? Or is it to show the institutional values that govern our strategic decision making? Um, and I want to kind of come back to that at the end, but that's sort of where we were when we were talking about public value, and the word well-being wasn't used um, in 2005 in the way that it is now. So what I wanted to do today was, um, right, so I've got 15 minutes, I've got like two minutes each on these or something, but um, I want to just talk to you a little bit about what Historic England have been doing on wellbeing and um, the importance of exciting things like frameworks um, and just talk about a little bit about what we're doing in terms of projects for next steps. And then in my summary and conclusions, just kind of, it's not quite a call to arms, but a kind of, this is where I think sectorally it might be useful to head but it's very much up for discussion if people think I'm talking rubbish. I was going to say something else then, and I remember we recorded. Um, so, um, we've done various things. We've, so I, I, the problem with old age is I cannot actually read that and this at the same time, I've just discovered. Um, we've been doing, uh, we've done a wellbeing assessment, which very kindly Richard showed earlier, my colleague Sarah Riley and um, uh, intern student uh, Claire Nolan and I worked on together. And we've done some insight work, which is actually really much more important than I realised it was going to be, where you actually ask our own staff what they think about wellbeing and why we should be doing it and how we should be doing it. Um, and we've done some looking at one kind of project within Historic England, just been doing a bit of work again on how could we make this more wellbeing orientated style of project. Um, so the assessment which uh, has three main areas to it, and it's online. Uh, a framework for considering wellbeing and heritage, which I will talk about in a minute. Some strategic objectives for wellbeing and the historic environment, and I'm gonna talk about that in language and approach a bit later. And what I call a logic model, but clearly some people call a theory of change, um, that summarizes our wellbeing strategy at the time of writing, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but is available online. Um, so I just wanna talk about the framework. Now it has, it, I have having been sitting at the back of this, but it's really difficult to see the bottom of the slides. So I'm just going to stand over here and uh, just explain a little bit about what this is. So all, all, all the framework is, is there's loads of stuff out there about well-being and archaeology, and well-being and heritage, well-being and historic environment, well-being and arts, and we started reading it, and the only way that my brain can actually function is to kind of try to put it into categories to make sense of it, otherwise I explode. So this is mostly an explosion and prevention mechanism for me, which is what are the kinds of well-being relationships to the historic environment that currently exist, where does historic England's own work fit into it, and how can we help the sector have a kind of broader, if you like, kind of cell of our contribution towards these different types of well-being and historic environment work. So for those of you who can't, I've also noticed that it's really blurry at the back, unless that is also my eyes. So we have six elements to the framework, um, you can argue about the terminology if you want to, but this is published now, so it's too late. So, heritage as process, what we mean by that is actually a lot of the stuff that you've talked about today, which is about volunteering as an active and committed relationship over time. Um, however, I think one of the things we spotted in doing our review is that many volunteer projects tend to capture a really limited demographic of employees educated in higher socioeconomic groups, and I know that isn't necessarily true of some of the projects today, but I think what we're seeing today are kind of the brilliant, more therapeutically targeted examples of that volunteer work, and there's a lot of work out there that isn't, like the Operation Nightingale stuff that you've seen today. Um, uh, Heritage's participation, in this context, what I mean by that is actually visiting sites of cultural interest, and there's been loads and loads of work on that. You can be 8.1% happy if you go to see a site and you're only 7.8% happy before you went in. Um, I think the value of these surveys are slightly limited because the degree of improvement is usually too slight to be statistically relevant and there's no causal relationship established as to whether you're actually quite a happy person before you went in. I also have a slight issue about our role being making happy people happier, but I'll come back to that at the end. Um, 
So there are real problems, and it relates mostly to curatorial practices. So that was in a world, I suppose, for us, when we used the Taken Park survey and the English heritage, whereas now that's English heritage's problem, arguably. Um, heritage as a mechanism. I, there are loads of examples. I think the British Museum Reminiscence Programme would be a, a, a useful example of this, where cultural assets are used to bring people together. They're kind of the binding mechanism in order to have some kind of therapeutic um, benefit. Uh, and they're much more to do with social interaction and creative opportunities and memory, and they're quite often used as a, as a focus for dementia projects. Um, heritage as healing, which is um, very where the primary driver is therapeutic, so the easiest way to explain this is the UCL really well-evaluated programme on healing in museums by Helen Chatterjee and others, which is done in an NHS context with NHS evaluation techniques, and everybody kind of understands it, if everybody medical understands it. Um, heritage is place, which is the book <coughs> on which there is least research. If you are thinking about places, how does it relate to belonging and identity in a way that we can actually show rather than just make assumptions about? Um, there has been some research on this, and our own publications on heritage accounts have summarised that where it exists in past years. But I feel like, in terms of research opportunities, this is a really huge growth area and should be a really huge growth area. And then heritage as environment, which I know Richard, I think, mentioned earlier, certainly somebody, about being outside or indeed being underwater. If it, the being in nature um, is inherently good for you, and certainly that sector is way ahead of us in terms of making the case to government and others about the value of their stuff to um, society at large. And this, this diagram simply uh, has those headings, so you can see what they are, and summarises, based on existing projects, the kinds of outcomes that tend to come from those different projects. Then it has a lovely little arrow that tells you that this automatically relates to the New Economics Foundation description of what you need in order to achieve individual well-being. Um, and that's about as far as we've got at the time, but I have to say, I think there's a slight problem with this diagram, even though I designed it, which is the bit in the middle, where I feel like it does have that sense of, and then a miracle occurs, and everybody's happy. And for me, this is the bit that needs the most work in terms of the sector making the case to other people. So we've all spoken today about how great everything is and why don't we do it differently or better. But frankly, at the moment, most people in the NHS that I talk to are saying, well, if you give me the evidence that there is a causal link and you compare it in a way that other projects have compared it and you can make the case that it's special, then it might be worth investing in. But I think there are real issues about really nailing the, the kind of stats for that middle bit in terms of evaluation and measurement. Um, so that, that kind of leads on to the issue of um, kind of what we're here for. I was interested, because I agree actually with your point earlier, that on one hand it doesn't really matter what the thing is, if you've got people together and it has those benefits, then that's a result and sometimes it's archaeology. But I think as a sector, we need to be able to have like two faces. One face that says that and says we are part of the cultural sector. This is England, in my case, because I'm historic England, but Britain's cultural offer that the government must continue to recognise and society should recognise too. But also the fact that if we don't have a particular reason for being here, a specificity about what we do, then why should they bother to care whether we evaluate it? Because they can just use the museum's and the green environment because they're doing it better already. So I thought, because I like frameworks, so my next framework is, what if we came up with a framework that said, if your project delivers these things in combination, that is almost unique um, for the, the kind of work that we're doing in archaeology and the historic environment. So that's our special pleading as to why we're special. No one thing is unique to us. Sorry, I'll put all up. So a combination of physical activity, we've had brilliant examples of that, and there are lots of Sports England do that all the time. What Sports England might not have is the crucial part in the sense of archaeology, which is forming a new relationship with the past and the creation of a new perspective. And some research has, like one article I've read, so there needs to be a little bit more work on this, but some research has suggested that that is the bit that provides the longitudinal, um, the, the longevity of impact. So we might want to focus on how do we demonstrate longevity of impact. Um, the combination of the past, connection with skills, feeling meaningful through productive contribution, something that actually that's all been covered by stuff we've looked at today. Social interaction, 
Uh, long-lasting benefit, which I've just mentioned, uh, the mixed projects and mixed evaluation methods and longitudinal analysis, which we've acknowledged that we're all lacking, but we actually need to nail that quite soon, and the wider collective sense of community, meaning making, etc. Um, so if we had a framework that said this is what the historic environment offers, and you could relate your evaluations to this framework, the sector would be able to say we can deliver in all of these areas in this way. So. Um, so the other point I guess I want to make is that, that well-being is, um, it's about doing stuff, but it's also an approach. And what I really, if I had one ambition within Historic Invid, it would be that we just changed our language based only on the way that we think about well-being. So I've decided to put up an example. This is not a new heritage cycle that has been approved by Historic Invid. This is just what I show because it's the kind of thing that I mean when I say this. So you remember <coughs> the old heritage cycle? which in absolutely no patronising tones at all tells you that if we tell you why it's interesting, then you will love it. And when you love it, because we love it, you will enjoy it because we've told you to enjoy it, and then you will understand it more, and then you, you, you get the gist, right? Then there are the five ways to well-being, which I assume you're familiar with, but give, keep learning, connect, take notice, and be active. Those are the ones created by the New Economic Foundation, and they have um, uh, a lot of currency. There's lots of virtuous cycles that you could look at to see how we could do this better, virtuous, you know, about embracing difference and inclusion. But what happens if you redesign the heritage cycle, but use the five ways of well-being as you're in for each of those things? And I'm not saying this is perfect, but the idea that you would then take notice of what matters to other people, connect better with communities, uh, support active partnership rather than just telling people that they should do it because we think it's lovely, uh, give back to society by protecting the historic environment and through partnership um, we can keep learning. Okay, so this is just a, a, an example of how an approach using wellbeing would change how we present ourselves. And I think you could argue that this also provides a much clearer pathway into the ambitions of inclusion and democratisation of heritage, but that's probably a bigger lecture. So the, only, the other example of this is... Um, that we drew up some strategic objectives for the historic environment and well-being following the same approach. So using the give, connect, be active, etc. And then saying, what would our strategic objectives be if we took this approach rather than said, you know, we need to be funded by government and we need to protect staff and all the usual things. I won't read it all out now because A, I'll run out of time and B, it's, uh, it's published anyway, so you can have a look at it. But those are just kind of like examples. So... In 30 seconds, two things in terms of next steps that we're doing in terms of projects is we've looked at our Heritage at Risk projects and done some insight work. And what we're going to do next is um, commission something <coughs> which will retrospectively evaluate the social impacts of some of our hard projects so that we can get an idea about what kinds of benefits to do with wellbeing have emerged as an organisation that goes, ooh, let's repair this building, oh, look, there's some community volunteers or a private owner, characterise those projects and the kinds of benefits you get to help us design better ways to embed wellbeing objectives into the beginning of the projects in the future. And the other slide is roughly the kinds of aims and objectives of that piece of work. And then we want to do something similar with our Sunderland Heritage Action Zones, and both of these are about to go out to tender. Uh, which will look at much more the belonging identity and place of a heritage action zone, which if you don't know what they are, Google it, because I don't have time to explain, but um, an area where lots of focused work is going on between us, the local authority and other partners, and to talk to the residents in the place which they live, not a poster that says come to the town hall and cross a barrier to talk to us by invitation, but talk to them in their tower blocks in the middle of the conservation area and build a long-term relationship with them to see how they feel about stuff so I like arrows and diagrams. So I just really kind of want to end by saying this is how, this is a sort of summary of what I think I mean. So well-being wasn't used as a term in 2005, but I see it along with community cohesion as a really crucial element of social impact, which itself is only a part of public benefit. So I'm not pretending that I'm solving public benefit problems. These are technical terms. I think well-being is a thing, okay? And it's a thing that does stuff. And then, after it does stuff, it does a bit more stuff. And the kind of stuff that I mean is it increases well-being. It actually has a very specific benefit. Um, and it can address inequalities, which is another huge lecture we don't have time for, that I think we should be actually addressing inequalities. 
it's a tool and um, it shows us stuff, it proves things, all of which are very important if we actually want money, frankly, and hopefully it changes what we do. And what I mean is that we need to increase the social impact of our work through using this as a new set of objectives. If we did it properly, we would automatically end up doing some of these things. Demonstrate the public benefit of archaeology um, and the approach and language stuff I've talked about. And in a way, almost more importantly, I think it's a lens through which we should see things so that it would change our perception of how we operate. We would be able to renew how we work more easily and we would learn a lot more from what we do because we would do it in a slightly different way. So, and again, I think if you wrote, if we, if we as an organisation had a plan and if every project had a plan that, that knew that this was the way it wanted to approach wellbeing and it decided really at the beginning, and I know Operation Nightingale, that's what its purpose is, but most of the projects I come across aren't like that. They're not dedicated therapeutic projects. It would automatically, through a wellbeing agenda, if your objective is to repair a historic building, that's easy if you repair a historic building. But if your objective is to um, work with a particular disadvantaged group in a locality that you're working in, then you would automatically be reducing barriers to the historic environment because you've changed your objectives. So address community cohesion and tolerance, address social exclusion, and broaden participant democracy. So this is what I meant at the beginning when I said, I think it's all kind of part of this pathway into diversity and uh, a more democratic view of heritage as well. Um, so it's a, it's a delivery tool. Um, and I'm gonna to be told to shut up, so I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is what I think we should do. Some people have said this already, but I really think it's important. We really need to be clear on what we intend to do. And I say that as an organisation and as a project, this is like a multi-level thing. I do have a framework diagram for this, but nobody likes it. It's too complicated, apparently. We must do longitudinal evaluation. We need to get together in a room, look at all the evidence that everybody has, see whether it compares, and then do it over time. Otherwise, we can not demonstrate the long-term benefits rather than just the, I was happy for the week I was doing something even though that in itself may be positive. Um, I think we, as certainly I speak from Stark England's point of view, we need to understand much better this relationship, not with the Heath Service, as it says on the slide, but with the Health Service and medical outcomes. Um, so I think what we need to do next in terms of the next steps, and I say we as the sector, not just Historic England is going to magically deliver this overnight, but we are pushing on all of these fronts in different areas. We need proper research on accessing underrepresented and hidden communities through archaeology. And I know there is some, and the Homeless Heritage Project at York is a really good example of that, and there are others. We need research on the applicability of well-being and health models. So this is what I was saying earlier about. So if we're doing a heritage risk project, some have volunteers, some don't. So if you're trying to instigate this and you've never done a well-being project before, you might have a, like in your head a kind of flow chart that says, well, if this one's got community volunteers in, then the kinds of well-being objectives I should think about are these. In a perfect world, you'd think, how do I redesign the project to make sure I reach well-being objectives? But at least you'd know what, how you could maximise the social impact of the character of the project that you're doing. Consensus build, this is just completely crucial if we want to be a sector in this area. Um, yeah, and this is to do with evaluation and frameworks. And specific evidence relating to archaeology with models of good practice, some of which there are, and I know that you've shown a lot of them, but I think we need to apply them more broadly and have lots of different kinds of models. Participation in the cultural sector's wellbeing agenda. So we are involved in the, and I never get its name right, I'm looking at Sara, Culture Wellbeing Alliance thing. The Alliance, it used to be the Museums, Arts and Wellbeing Alliance. It's now called Creative something else. But they're the secretariat to the APPG on cultural and well-being. Um, so I think being part of some of those groups is really crucial to find out where other people like museums are doing it better than us. Um, and also potential to links with, with everyday creativity trends. And actually, for those that were with the session where we heard Jill Chitty talk earlier, she talked about um, conservation and action. And they're the same thing in my head. They're kind of the, we're doing stuff over here, not right in the middle of where people already are. So, um, I should probably shut up and not read my front handle. Thank you. <laughs>